Everybody, it's good to be gathered with you on the Lord's Day. As we uh, continue in our worship, I invite you to turn with me uh, to the book of Romans, Romans chapter 6. I want to draw your attention to verse 19. Romans chapter 6, verse 19. Let's read and hear the Word of God together. I speak in human terms because of the weakness of your flesh. For just as you presented your members as slaves of uncleanness and of lawlessness leading to more lawlessness, so now present your members as slaves of righteous, righteousness for holiness. Amen. Let's pray together and seek God's help. Our Father, we thank You this morning for the gathering of the saints. We thank You for the blessing of singing to one another, of rehearsing Your Word, of reminding ourselves of Your sure promises that we stand upon. And Father, now as we come to consider Your Word more in depth, more particularly, we pray now, Father, that we would believe every portion of Your Word that we would believe that Christ has died not only to give us a right standing before You, but also to create us anew. To give us new power and strength to walk in a holy manner. Father, we pray that You would be gracious to us and that You would grant us not only to be hearers of Your Word, but that we would be doers that we would listen to Your Word and contemplate it prayerfully, that we would ask You from our hearts to make true in us the things that Your Word speaks of. Father, we pray this morning for any who are in our midst who are strangers to Christ, who remain still unbelieving and dead in their trespasses. Father, we pray we intercede on their behalf that You would be gracious to them. We pray that You'd be merciful to open the eyes of their hearts. That they would feel and know their, their powerlessness over sin to overcome it. That they would be convinced of their need of the cross of Christ to, to become a new man. Father, we pray that You would work by Your Holy Spirit in their hearts Make effectual the things of Your Word to them. Bless Your people, we pray, Father. We ask that You would continue to sanctify each and every one of us from one degree of glory to the next. We pray for our children, that You'd be gracious to them, that You would cause all of them at a young age to seek the Lord, that they would look to Your Word, that they would meditate upon it, that they would seek You in prayer, that they would walk in obedience to Your Gospel. Father, bless each and every one we pray. We pray that You would keep the evil one from us, that he would not snatch away the seed of Your Word that is sown. We pray that each of us would go out of here today resolved to believe Your Word, to trust Your promises, and to trust You for Your grace. We pray for Your help now that You would bless us and draw near to us. We ask these things in Christ's name. Amen. Well, this morning I'd like to pick up part two as we're taking just a brief break from the Gospel of John. I'd like to pick up part two of what we began two weeks ago. Um, two, two weeks ago, we considered the subject of killing sin from Colossians chapter 3. And this morning, I want to now pick up and focus on cultivating practical helps to holiness. 
And before we jump into these practical helps, I want to begin by drawing our attention to the principle that Paul gives us here from the text that we've read in Romans chapter 6, verse 19. And so if you have your Bibles open, have them open to Romans 6 at this, at this point. But this, this is a very important verse for us to understand and an, an encouraging verse. Because while Paul is making a contrast here between sin and holiness, he's also drawing a parallel between sin and holiness. Namely, though sin and holiness are antithetical to one another in terms of what they are, they both share this principle in common. Namely, they are both habit-forming. He first states this negatively. When we presented formerly our members as slaves of lawlessness, he says it led to more lawlessness. That that is, the, that is a law. That that is what sin does. Every sin that we commit feeds sin. And it reinforces the habit of sin. And it makes it easier for us to sin in the future. Uh, as unbelievers, Paul said previously in chapter 6, this habit of sin was so strong in us that we were said to be under the dominion of sin. Every time we lusted or coveted or hated or lied, we were growing more and more mature in evil. More frequent in evil. More depraved in the degrees of evil. More high-handed. And Romans 1 describes that progression, that descent into sin. However, thankfully, and this should encourage the Christian, Paul says here in verse 19 that that same principle applies in the realm of grace to our pursuit of holiness. Which ought to uh, bolster the, the Christian's confidence that progress in holiness is actually possible for us. He says, so now, formerly you presented your members as slaves of sin and, uh, and lawlessness. He says, so now, Present your members as slaves of righteousness. And the ESV, I think, helpfully glosses the meaning here. Leading to sanctification. In other words, just as saying yes to sin leads to more sinning, the more we say no to sin, the more we walk as the new man that we are created anew in Christ Jesus, the more the soul gets fortified against sin's allure the more we present our bodies as instruments of righteousness, the, the deeper we are carving those ruts which keep our feet on the path of righteousness that leads to sanctification. And Christian, that, that should be an encouragement to us this morning. That we can, by the grace of God, by the help of His Spirit, develop habits of holiness. It is possible for us to develop habits of thinking pure and good thoughts. It is possible for us to develop disciplined habits of intimate prayer with God and meditation upon His Word. We can create by His grace habits of being led by the Spirit as we seek the Lord's face in the Word of God. Habits that fortify and protect our souls from sin's influence. But, like all habits, they are only attained by frequent, intentional repetition and discipline. Hence the command. Paul tells us, just as you formerly did this, so now present your members. That implies intentionality on the Christian's part. We do not fall into habits of holiness. Uh, to, to give you an analogy, if, if the car of our lives used to be stuck in the deep ruts of the path of sin, and if you've ever got your car you know, stuck deep in, in, in a rut, you know that in order to get your wheels up and over and out of that rut requires, it, it takes difficulty. 
because the car wants to naturally go the way of the rut, and, and you're trying to force it to go a, a way that's unnatural to it. That's how we were, dead in sin, riding smoothly in the rut of sin. But now, being made alive in Christ, we want to, by the Spirit's help, that's the only way we can do this, we want to now get out of that rut, which will take difficulty, and we want to get the car of our lives now to run down the center in the ruts of the path of righteousness. So that we're now locked into a good path. And those new ruts, those new habits, keep us and hold us making progress on the path that leads to glory. And so that, that's the focus of this morning's sermon. Developing, cultivating those ruts, those disciplines in the path to holiness. And I want to encourage us this morning in six habits. Six habits. And from this point, we'll be departing from Romans chapter 6 and we'll be in various, various texts for our consideration. Six habits, practical helps for cultivating holiness. Number one must be the first place that you start in the discussion of cultivating holiness. Christian, we must cultivate a love for the Scriptures. Okay. We must cultivate a love for the Scriptures, the Word of God. The Scriptures are the Christian's indispensable companion for holiness. I, I guarantee it. The Christian who leaves off the, the reading, and not only the reading, but the meditation upon the Word of God, will find themselves winding up in the ER, spiritually speaking. Because the Spirit of God uniquely blesses the child of God and grows the child of God in his meditation upon God's Word. And I emphasize that word meditation, which is distinct from reading. You, you can read the Word of God and walk away forgetting what you've read. Jesus prays in His high priestly pr uh, prayer, John 17, 17, sanctify them in the truth. Your Word is truth. Peter tells us, 1 Peter 2, verse 2, desire the pure milk of the Word that you may grow thereby. It is the Word of God which makes the Christian, first of all, an infant in evil. But secondly, it's the Word of God that matures the Christian in righteousness. And as I said two weeks ago, I, I want to encourage us, Christian, there, there are two ways you can listen to this sermon. You can listen to it indifferently as one who is passively just learning about facts and methods, or you can listen as one who realize, realizes this is God in His Word telling me who has the disease of sin how I may grow in righteousness and holiness. But Christian, we have a choice in this. We have a choice in all of these disciplines, uh, habits that I'm going to mention this morning. God has appointed specific means for our growth. And it's as though God has said to us, here, here is how I will feed you. Here is how I will nourish you. And Christian, if we just decide to say, no thank you, but I'm going to feed in these pastures, we will starve. Peter says, desire the pure milk of the Word of God. If we don't desire the Word of God, we will not read the Word of God. And if we don't read the Word of God, we won't search it and we won't meditate upon it. And ultimately, we will be a dry branch trying to live disconnected from the vine that gives us life. Christian, it is a sure principle that if Scripture is not what we intentionally make, what controls our heart and our mind, something else will control our heart and our mind. And whatever those other things are, they will in turn grow stronger and keep us from the Word of God. 
Right? You, you've all experienced that, I'm sure. You, you miss a day of reading and prayer and meditation because you, know, I had, you tell yourself, I have to get into the office early or I had to get everyone's lunches ready or what, whatever, whatever it might be. And before you know it, you miss another day. Well, I missed yesterday. It's not such a big deal to miss today. Pretty soon those things crowd out the reading of the Word of God and you now have a routine that has actually squeezed out the importance of meditation upon God's Word and communion with God. And what what does that lead to? The Christian becomes dry. The Christian becomes joyless, impatient, aimless in life. But contrasted with that, what does Psalm 19 say happens in the soul of a believer when they read the Word of God? Psalm 19 says the law of God restores the soul. The Scriptures make wise the simple. The Scriptures rejoice the heart. Christian, I want to I give you an encouragement and, and a practical suggestion here. Okay, one, one encouragement and, and a practical suggestion. The encouragement is this. When you come to God's Word, approach the Bible as though it is God's personal love letter addressed to you. And I know some of you, you hear that and you think, you know, we've got books nowadays that have been written like that and that sounds a little too cheesy. The Puritans actually weren't afraid to speak in, in those. They, they would say, come and, and read these words written in blood. This, read these love letters written in Christ's blood to you, believer. What I'm, what I'm emphasizing here is come to the Bible remembering this is not just a generic dead book, but this is God providentially feeding my soul from this passage today. And with that perspective, here's, here's the practical suggestion. With that perspective, consider writing down applications from what you've read in order that you might review those throughout the day. In other words, view what you have read, view what God has fed you with as God's mission for you that day. And what that does is it causes you not to just read for reading's sake, so that, you know, check, I read my two chapters or whatever it is, but rather that is you resolving to actually live upon and live out the manna that God gave you that day in His Word. So I'll give you an example. We've been reading uh, through the book of Proverbs. And it's honestly been refreshing and great to just walk away from a chapter of Proverbs with a few pointed applications. Uh, you know, whether, you know, depending on what chapter you're in, uh, might have something to do with being diligent in your work or being honest in your speech or avoiding gossip or any, any gamut of, of things. And to carry those throughout the day and to constantly be thinking about them, how can I obey this? How, how can I obey Proverbs chapter 11, verse 10? That is, that's actively living upon God's Word as opposed to just reading it and then going away aimlessly throughout the day. Or if you're reading a, par uh, a parable or a narrative um, or, or a different you know, type of literature besides wisdom literature. It's very beneficial to actually take the time to meditate on the parable and to write down what, what are the applications for me from this parable? What are the things in this narrative that warn the Christian or that require duties of the Christian? And then take those things throughout, uh, with you throughout your day trying to purposefully obey those things and put those things into action. God told the Israelites in Deuteronomy 6 that they were to bind His words on their hands and on their doorposts. So, sometimes we need training wheels like that. 
Uh, Israel's kings, Deuteronomy 17, were commanded to have a copy of the law of God and to study it daily that they might rule the people wisely in the fear of God. The point is, Christian, we want the Word of God to really dwell in our hearts so that it governs us. So that it permeates our meditations and works its way into our hands and our feet so that we guard our paths to glorify the Lord. That that is, Christian, a prerequisite for holiness. That we cherish the Word of God. We obey the words that we cherish. How many many times, if you're a parent with young children, you've, you've done this, How many times do we have the the conversation with our kids after they've disobeyed, even though we've instructed them, and and we tell them, you've disobeyed Daddy's words because you didn't value Daddy's words? And if if they say, you know, Daddy, I forgot, we say, well, you forgot because you counted Daddy's words as a thing not worthy to be remembered. You counted them as, as a light thing. But Christian, think about it. That is exactly what we are guilty with so often with God's Word. We often sin not because God hasn't spoken to us, but it's because we didn't hide and cherish the Word of God in our hearts that we might not sin against Him. It's because we didn't value God's Word. We didn't intentionally allow it to permeate my thinking and my heart so that I obey it and and it's constantly in the forefront of my mind. That's the first habit is we must cultivate a love for the Scriptures. That brings us to the second thing. Second habit, we must pray without ceasing. And by the way, these first two are more lengthy than the, the last four. And so if you're timing me and you're wondering how long are we going to be here, the, the f- latter four points are not as lengthy. Second habit, Christian, we must pray without ceasing. Okay? Warfield said this. Warfield said, quote, Prayer is by nature a confession of weakness, need, and dependence. It is a cry for help. He said, no one can take this attitude without it having an effect on his character. For in prayer, we learn to look away from ourselves to one higher and greater and acknowledge our utter dependence upon God. Paul commands us, 1 Thessalonians 5.17, pray without ceasing. And Christians often read that and the first thing that they, that they respond with is that's impossible. It's an impossible command. Does God want me to do nothing but pray? But that misses the point. Because we only think that when we think about prayer as an isolated time when we fold our hands and we close our eyes, so to speak. The point of 1 Thessalonians 5.17 is not that God doesn't want the Christian to do anything but pray. The point of 1 Thessalonians 5.17 is that God does not want us to do anything without prayer. Uh, John Bunyan said, um, he said, "You uh, you can do more than pray after you have prayed, but until you have prayed, you can't do more than pray. It's one of those things you have to think about a couple times to understand what he's saying. But once it clicks, you realize that's exactly right. After you've prayed, sure, God calls us to do more things. But he's saying, until you've done that first thing, you you can't do anything more important than pray. Paul explains this more, I think fills it out more in Ephesians chapter 6. Ephesians chapter 6, the whole armor of God filled with uh, staccato commands to the Christian to, to gird ourselves with the weapons of warfare God supplies us by His grace. And, and so he tells us to put on the belt of truth, uh, the breastplate of righteousness, the shield of faith, take up the, the sword of the Spirit. 
And at the very end of that, in verse 18, he closes by saying, praying at all times in the Spirit with all prayer and supplication. In other words, as we put on, put on the belt of truth, what are we doing? We are praying. As we wield the sword of the Spirit, we are praying. I can't, I can't remember who said it, and I couldn't find it this week. Some, someone said that they, they longed for their day to be nothing but one long, rarely interrupted co uh, conversation with God. And I, I think that's what Paul's getting at when he says pray without ceasing. Christian, we don't just have seasons of prayer and then leave the presence of God to go about our work. Rather, we are to think of ourselves as Christians, as those who never untether ourselves from God who is our rock. Like, like a young child, when, when she sees a, a busy street, just immediately and instinctively reaches out for her dad's hand. We, as, as a child of God, are to develop the habit, the, the, as instantaneous as we can get it, habit of realizing walking through life without my Father is a dangerous thing. Running to our Father in, in everything. Being constant in prayer keeps at the forefront of our mind the God who is there, the God whom we live before, and the God whom we live from. Prayer, to kind of jump off of Warfield's definition of prayer, prayer is the act of the soul by which we actually put our money where our mouth is when we proclaim that we are beggars. We can say we're beggars all day long, but if we don't pray, we don't believe we're beggars. In Him we live and move and have our being. That's true of us physically, whether we acknowledge that or not. But in Christ, the child of God lives and moves and has His being. Every single moment of every day, we are in need. And every moment, God is willing to draw near to us in Christ who is that reservoir of grace and help. And Christian, we will, we will fail if we don't draw from Christ. God will humble His children. We'll face plant like Peter did when he failed, though he was warned repeatedly, to watch and pray. Those two things go hand in hand. We watch to discern our needs and we pray to ask God to come and to fill those needs. The Christian, it takes active vigilance to develop this habit. Just thinking about myself, there are, to my shame, there are too many times in which I face something or I walk through something and at the end of it, I turn around and I realize I didn't even pray. I went into that meeting like a practical atheist. Right? Or I faced a problem and I thought about it. I thought about it up and down and forwards and backwards and I read books on the subject but I didn't stop to seek God in all my work and all my labors that He would give me light. Remember the, uh, the Gibeonites in Joshua chapter 9. The Gibeonites deceive Israel. Right? They put on the fake you know, tattered garments and you know, we're not from here, we're from a long, on a long journey. And even Israel's leaders, Joshua included, failed to consult with the Lord and to seek the Lord's wisdom. And God humbled them for it. The Gibeonites remained a thorn in Israel's side because of their failure to depend upon God. And that, that's exactly the same principle with us. God opposes the proud, but He gives grace to the humble. 
And prayer is essentially humility in action. Children, young kids, I want to encourage you. Pray. Pray, guys. God is with you everywhere you go. He's in your your room, your closet. He's with you at school. Talk to God. God invites us, all of us, no matter what age we are, to seek His face, to know Him, to depend on Him for His help and His grace. Kids, that's just as true for you guys as it, as it is for grown-ups. Focus, focus on a, something from God's Word. And, and talk to God about it. Meditate on His Word in the presence of God. Search your own heart in the presence of God. And ask Him to give you grace and, and understanding and strength to live according to His Word. That brings us to the third thing, third habit. Number three, be ruthless with worldliness. Be ruthless with worldliness. Worldliness is like how one drop of poison can make the whole body sick. The pride of life, the the lust of the flesh and of the eyes are things that if we do not completely seek to to restrain that influence, it will flood the soul and contaminate and defile us. I mentioned a couple weeks ago how the fight against sin must be a comprehensive, a universal fight against sin. All sin. And that we can't succeed in any one area if we are lax and loose in this area over here. And therefore, when it comes to worldliness, brother and sister, we must with vigilance guard our hearts from its influence. Jesus tells us, Matthew 6, 24, no one can serve two masters. He will either love the one and hate the other or he will hold to the one and he will despise the other. And John, in his first epistle, contrasts our love for God the Father with love for the world. And those two loves are incompatible with one another. And so what we must do is we must, as God's child, determine to make a clean break from worldly company, worldly activities, worldly habits, like, like Joshua, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. The Christian must resolve to part with the idols of Egypt. Number one, that begins with a battle against the lust of the flesh. The lust of the flesh. We must guard our hearts against indulging the flesh in its passions. That includes, first of all, casting off all forms of sexual impurity and immorality. Both seeking it out and desiring others to seek it from us. Things like flirting. Coveting another who isn't our spouse. Searching out suggestive or explicit images. Wearing immodest dress that draws lust. All of those things belong to this world. They're worldly. They're sensual. They're the passions of the flesh. And the Christian must shut them out. But the lust of the flesh goes beyond that. It pertains to all of our appetites. Being careful in our eating and our drinking. In our recreation. Making sure that we are Participating in lawful recreation. And even when it's lawful, not to excess so as to become lazy and idolaters. It involves, for parents, keeping our children from worldly gatherings where sin is the central focus and is celebrated. And in in all of those things, we need to avoid not only the sins themselves, but the, the steps that may lead to those sins. 
Secondly, we must guard against the lust of the eyes. The lust of the eyes, when, when John warns against the lust of the eyes, what he's getting at is that we must carefully guard our eyes from being dazzled by what the world can give us if we become like the world. As in when Satan tempted our Lord, when Satan offered him all the kingdoms of this world, I will give you if you will but bow down and worship me. And so Christian, we need to diligently flee things like covetous thoughts of respect and honor we could get if we sacrificed faithfulness. We need to turn away from coveting gain that we could have by dishonesty. We need to, we, we must not desire corrupt friendships that could be gained by sin. We, we need to guard our eyes, as it were, from the dazzle of the world and its promises if we become like it. Thirdly, we must flee the pride of life, John says. Pride in ourselves. Pride in our accomplishments, pride in our possessions, our position, our authority, our knowledge. Whatever it is, we need to put with all of our strength, seek to put that garment of pride off of us. Because it will inhibit us from depending upon God and receiving grace for holiness. That's the third thing, is be ruthless with worldliness. Fourth, fourth practical habit. Number four, Christians, seek the help of others in your pursuit of holiness. Seek the help of others in pursuing holiness. We need mentors. We need companions. Godly examples and friends. Just like with any trade or any skill, right? We learn best by being an apprentice to a mentor. They show us how it's done. They speak to us of their experiences of how it is done. So too, in the work of holiness, we need companions. Proverbs 13.20 He who walks with the wise will be wise, but the companion of fools will be destroyed. In 2 Corinthians chapter 1, Paul elaborates on how he received mercy from God in his afflictions so that he might then show mercy and compassion to the Corinthians. And that's how we should think about what the Lord is doing in everything that He teaches, teaches us. The Lord teaches us things so that we might be an instrument of help to others. The, the church, the community of the, uh, the body of Christ ought to be that kind of body. I think of the man in, in Mark's Gospel whose friends were so eager to get him to Christ that they tore off the roof of the house to lay the man down in the presence of Christ. We need friends like that. And we need to be friends like that. The church ought to be a community not just of lone rangers kind of doing their own thing, but we come together once a week, but rather a community of examples and mutual teaching and just as significantly, a community of prayer for one another. Uh, Paul, I already mentioned Ephesians 6, verse 18. Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit. And then he, he goes on and he says being watchful to this end with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints. We need to pray for one another in our pursuit of holiness. We need to pray with one another. And so Christian, I, I encourage you to seriously consider this. Who do you make your closest companions? Th that is one of the most important decisions we make in life. 
Because we will become like them. Children, again, like I said, we've been reading through Proverbs and it is amazing how often Solomon warns my son, do not go with this group of people. Don't be drawn in and enticed when they say, come with us. Children, I want to encourage you. Choose your companions wisely. Choose your lifelong friends wisely. Ask yourself, I'll just give you a practical something something to think through. Ask yourself, the people you're friends with right now, why why do you admire them? Is it just for worldly things or is it because this is an admirable person who trusts the Lord? Choose companions that are going to encourage you to pursue the Lord, not draw draw you away from the Lord. Number five. Fifth habit. When you fail, get back up as quickly as you can. When you fail, get back up as quickly as you can. I was reading uh, Jerry Bridges this, this week. Uh, the pursuit, what is it? The pursuit of holiness, pursuit of forgetting that. Yeah, okay. Um, and he makes the point that there is a world of difference between failing and becoming a failure. And I think it, Joel Beakey makes a similar, similar point. And I think it's a very important and brilliant point. Because Christian, the reality is you will fail. The Word of God tells you that that is unfortunately a fact. If we say we have no sin, we are a liar. And you know by experience that that's true. In fact, Luther said, um, the, the godly and righteous man actually feels more often to be a loser in his struggle against sin than he does a victor in his struggle against sin. But here's the thing, Christian. The godly man or woman or child perseveres through their failures. Proverbs 24, 16. A righteous man may fall seven times, but rises again. Failure doesn't cause the saint to just give up. Throw in the towel. It drives him with with heart aching, with remorse and godly sorrow, but it, it drives him nonetheless to get back up, go back to his God, to go back to the Gospel, to Christ who receives sinners of whom I am the foremost, and it causes him to repent more thoroughly and to seek God's face more diligently in the future. That is an aspect of holiness that might seem um, somewhat strange. That turning back to the Lord after failing and turning back more quickly over time is actually a sign of increasing holiness. Yes, we can talk about the ideal. Ideally, we never would have strayed out of the path of righteousness in the first place. But realistically, when we do, we make a grace-filled effort to not stay long in the path of sin. Christian, cultivate the habit of repenting quickly. Confessing quickly. Don't give in to the devil's thinking of, well, I've blown it today. And, and, I, and I blew my, my winning streak that I had going. And so I might as well just stay here and enjoy myself for a bit. The time to turn from sin is always now. God's mercies are made new to us every morning. In fact, God's mercies are ready to be made new to us at lunchtime. And in the afternoon and at evening. Like the father of the prodigal son, 
He is standing ready and willing to receive us as soon as we, like that you know, hard-headed son, come to our senses. We are to return to God. Sixthly, last thing, last habit. This is a, an overarching discipline. Commit yourself, Christian, completely to God. Commit yourself completely to God. Second Chronicles 16, verse 9 says, The eyes of the Lord run to and fro across the whole earth to give strong support to those whose heart is whole towards Him. God gives strength to the heart that is sincerely whole towards the Lord. Joel Beakey said, quote, Live present tense total commitment to God. And this is why I say this is an overarching discipline. This is what we need to seek to be every moment of every day. That we come to God with an attitude. We sing it. And we need to pray it. We need to come to God with an attitude of here's my heart, my whole heart. Take and seal it for your courts above. Take my life and let it be consecrated, Lord, to Thee. We need to come to the Lord and cultivate an attitude of wholehearted devotion that says, Lord, whatever needs to be cut off and filed and sanded, Lord, would You do it in Your servant's heart. Wrestle the idols from Your servant's hand. God honors that request when it's made in sincerity. Christian, don't go the way of thinking just one more time. After tonight or tomorrow or after vacation or after the end of the year, whatever it is, postponed obedience is disobedience. And tomorrow's holiness is today's impurity. Not to mention, it'll be harder tomorrow. Christian, make it your aim to not sin at all. I know, even as you hear that, I know as well as you do, that's not going to happen. But that doesn't change the fact that that should be your goal. Uh, Jerry Bridges, again in that book, he said, when a soldier goes out to war, he does not make it his goal to just get hit a little bit. <laughs> he makes it his aim to not get hit at all. That, that should be the Christian's attitude towards sin and pursuing holiness. And so Christian, what that means to summarize the, the last two weeks is we need to, by the grace of God, resolve to hang up all of our reservations to be done with all euphemisms. Make no provision for the flesh, Paul says. And to seek God earnestly in the means He has appointed for our growth. Seek God earnestly in the meditation of His Word. Seek God earnestly, moment by moment, in prayer. Seek God in watchfulness in self-denial and in, in sincerity and fullness of devotion in heart, we are to seek the Lord. Let's pray and ask that God would give us grace to do those things. Father, we come to You as Your unworthy servants. You have been so gracious to us and so patient with us. We thank You, Father, for Your abundant grace that is like an ocean that has no, no bottom. Father, we thank You for 
your sustaining grace and sustaining power in how you keep all of your sheep. Father, we all confess corporately as a church, we have not been nearly as faithful as we ought to be in the, in the disciplines and the habits that Your Word tells us to pursue. We pray, Father, that You would forgive us. That You would cause us to have remorse over neglect of Your Word. Over neglect in prayer and being sidetracked by all manner of things in our lives that, that squeeze prayer from our, from our hearts and our lives. Father, we pray that You would renew our strength. Lord, that You would renew our resolve to obey Your Word. Father, thank You that today Your mercies have been made new that today we can begin to make habits of holiness that lead to more holiness. Father, help us to to consider these things with intentionality. Keep us from being passive listeners to Your Word. That we would take to heart and that You would move our wills and our feet and our hands to actually discipline ourselves to do these things. And Father, we know and believe the promise of Your Word that in so doing, we will find the joy and the freedom of holiness. Bless us now as we draw near to You in the Lord's table. Bless this means of grace to Your people to strengthen us for these very things that we would come to the table this morning Believing that Christ is the one who is our sanctification. He is the one who gives holiness to us. Cause us to feed upon Christ, to draw from Him. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.